and welcome to Dyer Times. I'm your host, David Dyer, and we're here in Ithaca, New York on a slightly rainy day at Cornell's Cooperative Extension in Tompkins County. I'm actually here to take part in a course called the Wilderness Survival Instructor Course. Um, we're going to meet some of the instructors, check out some of the things, look at some of the skills, have a good time. So let's get to it. I'm Tim Drake. Pleasure to meet you, David Dyer. David Dyer. Uh, you obviously know we're at Ithaca because it's raining. That's, yes, it's it's done that for the last it's, three it's, weeks. It's a definitive uh, indicator uh, of location. So, uh, but yeah, we're up here actually where Primitive Pursuits uh, does a lot of our programs uh, up at the 4-H Acres. And we currently actually have the Forest Preschool happening in the background. So Excellent. Excellent. if you hear some children uh, giggling and having fun or singing songs, that would be uh, what that is. Seems like a pretty normal thing up here though. Uh, I've yeah. been, been here for the last three weeks with the uh, Wilderness uh, Survival uh, instructor course nice. and uh, seems like there's a lot of programs going on uh, in, in and around here uh, pretty regularly. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Primitive Pursuits uh, has been going for, I guess we're going up towards uh, almost 14 years now. Wow. It's been uh, growing, picking up speed in different ways. We started as uh, you know, after school programs, taking kids out and, uh, and now it's uh, the Wilderness Instructor course, uh, which you're part of taking here with us. Uh, forest preschools, college programs, uh, homeschool programs, adult sort of weekend skills workshops like uh, bow making, high panning. Wow, so uh, a lot of really stuff. the true definition of primitive. Primitive, yes. And also the, you know, we're, we're shooting for anyway the true definition of like kind of a, something for everybody. Uh, it's really, I guess, a way for us to kind of practice skills that we believe to be lifelong skills. So start at three and go till you uh, can't move anymore. Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, since you know I'm here taking the, the uh, instructor course, tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, I know I've been in it for the last three weeks. We're actually in week three of four. Uh, you know, there's an early track, which is, uh, what, 16 weeks uh, with every meeting every Friday, right. and then a late track with uh, four days a week, uh, you know, on a four-week basis. Nice. Yeah, so uh, as you have experienced, it's a bit of an uh, adventure. Um, every day. Every day. Uh, we like to keep uh, certain parts secret so that the it's uh, in the moment type experience, you know. Absolutely. Uh, again, as you can attest to, we don't hand out the curriculum beforehand. No, uh, not at all. Because we, we want it to be a very personalized experience. We want people to be able to kind of take it at their their own speed and to challenge themselves uh, in ways that are meaningful to them. So, but um, yeah, you know, focusing on some of the hard skills of making fire without matches, uh, bow drill, uh, two person type friction kits. Or even 20 people. Here comes the forest preschool. Yeah, yeah. They have fun in the background. <laughs> Very nice. Um, so yeah, moving into other areas like that. Uh, you know, we had the trapping. Dave Hall came out and joined us. Did a really nice workshop on oh Paiute figure fours, um, deadfalls, some snares, things like that. But also getting into uh, at least discussions on kind of baiting and topography, kind of where the animals are moving, stuff so like that. The Paiute traps. Um, oh, some some awesome uh, kind of innovative traps that Dave had been working on himself. So uh, to catch maybe uh, pilfering Ooh. squirrels that might take out multiple cliff bars in one go. Yeah, uh, say twenty. Twenty. Yeah. They're like superhuman squirrels. It's kind of kind of ridiculous. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, shelter uh, construction, so what does it take to build a shelter that, uh, especially where we live, can withstand a lot of rain and a lot of uh, elemental uh, challenges. So, To include uh, Jed Jordan, which is the other instructor of the course, uh, nice. climbing up and jumping up and down on it to make sure it's structurally sound. Structurally sound. You want it to be able to take a, a decent hit. I mean, if a tree oh, came absolutely. down in a windstorm, yeah. you don't want to find out then while you're in it. Uh, yeah, so 10-gallon water test. <laughs> Five gallons, five gallons again uh, onto a, a shelter. So we, we didn't do too bad. No, we only got a little wet, a little right. wet. A little drippage, but you had an hour. Yeah, we did. We did. So uh, you know, and you had to uh, in that hour challenge. You guys, this is a group of uh, fourteen. Fourteen built a, a full-size shelter. Um, got a fire with uh, friction kits. Uh, crafted a container out of uh, bark that could hold water and purified the water using uh, hot stones. And I think we made tea out of that. Right? And we, we made uh, chaga, tea? chaga and pine needle tea. So that was, that, that was a pretty good success rate. Absolutely. Right. Well, uh, tell me a little bit more about the making fire without matches and the, the, the friction kits, you know, uh, kind of where that came from, what, what that is. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, we're not shy to use matches, lighters, flint and steel, whatever it is. Uh, 
It's just that at a certain point, they run out. I mean, if you really can't go back and get more matches, uh, even if you're great with them, you can only kind of carry so many. So, and more often than not, when you might find yourself needing them is you dump your canoe, you dump your kayak, uh, or things just get soaked in a rainstorm. So friction kits, I do think, actually still have a, a place in the modern world, even though they're a very old skill. Uh, because uh, forest, trees, resources are there. A knife is going to speed up the process, but you certainly can do it with stone tools. Uh, so making making fire by friction, uh, when you get good at it, you know, it really takes less than a minute. Like you got your, if you have your kit, I've seen people crank out coals with. Well, we, we've been doing it in the rain for three weeks, so yeah. not so, too bad. Not too shabby at all. Um, good stuff. But uh, they have some really interesting techniques uh, here that I've learned that I've never seen done anywhere else. And uh, I'm not going to give those away. You'll have to come and check those out for yourself. Sweet. Um, yeah, so I, I've actually seen in some of our youth programs a, uh, an 11 year old kid carve a kit from scratch. Uh, make the bow, the rope, everything, and get a coal. So, wow. uh, with two people, the, if, if you get a chance to check out the two-person partnered up kit, um, my own son and Dave Hall's son partnering together when they were seven and eight, you know, cranking out coals. That's so, pretty amazing. Uh, it's definitely something that you should all be able to do. Give it some practice. If you're struggling, just keep picturing seven-year-olds doing it and know <laughs> that you're doing something you wrong. Yes, yes. So. <laughs> absolutely. Um, with the friction kits you talked about, uh, you know, getting getting the coal and walking in the forest and getting that done. Uh, if you actually want to check out uh, one of my former videos, which is how to make fire from what you can find in your car, you can click here. Uh, but they do things a whole lot differently here uh, in, in technique-wise, uh, and I actually found it a lot easier. Um, and one of those is to make natural cordage uh, from what you can find in the forest. Nice. Yeah. So. Uh, some people talk about the survival necessities as being uh, shelter, water, fire, and food. Uh, but I have heard people, and I'm becoming one of them, who says, and rope. Uh, so um, basically, I, I believe that perhaps early jewelry was really just a means of keeping important materials close to you. So it could have been wearing like a baseboard on your neck for a friction fire, uh, which some of our instructors do, uh, or wearing something like this, which uh, uh, and if you haven't started using your teeth yet as an extra uh, hand, uh, you will, because it comes in handy. But um, so this is my beautiful bracelet. People like it. They think it looks pretty. <laughs> but for me, it's my uh, friction fire cord right here. So this uh, can be, oh, double reverse wrapped, uh, which is another way of describing uh, the cord making that we do. The but this is, this is strong, very, very, very strong. Uh, I've seen people make long, long lengths for fishing line, uh, you know, trap parts, uh, cords for the Paiute, uh, but you know, for me, this is my uh, cord for my bow drill kit. Very cool, now that cord there, it's, it's three or four feet long, yeah. uh, and can you tell me a little bit about what it took to make that? Yeah, so maybe six, eight stalks of uh, the dog bane plant and, and harvest it at the right time of year. Um, there's a lot of other things that we could be choosing from uh, milkweeds, nettles, uh, getting into the trees, basswoods, hickories, things like that. But, but this particular one, uh, because I like to, you know, uh, be a little bit particular about it, maybe took 20, 25 minutes to make. Uh, not too long. Uh, cool. And if you get into some of the advanced techniques, leg rolling, stuff like that, you could go faster. Very neat. That's, that's definitely one of the things that uh, I found very valuable in this course and learning. Because uh, like you say, you know, cordage and rope uh, make all the difference for, you know, pretty much everything you do out there. Shelter building and, and friction kits and, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. Well, uh, I know one of my favorite things from the course so far was the Adel Atlas. Uh, getting to play with that, that very primitive nice. dart and lever. Um, yeah. And uh, you had a guest instructor come in and, and show us some of that? Yeah, um, Bob Berg, uh, Thunderbird Addle Addle. Excellent, excellent. I'll put the link in the description below. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, so Bob's uh, world-renowned, travels all over uh, teaching workshops, and but he actually makes these kits from scratch. And he doesn't just kind of make any. He makes a lot, different types. Uh, some are replica. Uh, uh, some of them are replicas of, uh, you know, kind of prehistoric, very particular ancient ones. Some of his stuff has shown up on... Uh, Discovery Channel, uh, so cool. you, you can actually see uh, one there that we got to use here. So, but uh, yeah, Bob Berg. So an addle addle. Um, when you get a chance to, to check it out, I mean, I guess the way I describe it is if you can imagine, imagine pitching a baseball and then having to do that with your arm kind of restrained, how much less ability you'd have. 
So the atlatl is like this, but then you're holding the spear thrower. So you're basically getting uh, a multiplication of you know tenfold of power. Yeah, give me a level large it. enough, and I'll move the world. Right. So definitely. Very cool. Yeah, and that, like I said, that was my absolute, well, one of my favorite parts, you know, I'm a, kind of a weapons guy, so yeah. it was pretty neat to see one of the oldest weapons, uh, and so, you know, kind of the progression of it. And the uh, atlatls were, you know, used by early human hunters hunting mastodons, woolly mammoths. Some people say that's actually what led to their demise. Uh, oh, wow. So you can hunt some, some big creatures with them. I've uh, seen people put uh, atlatls through uh, tin roofing, so, like, serious force with them. Uh, they can be thrown great distances. They, they are powerful. Bob himself uh, uh, uses them for spear fishing wow. with ropes tied off to them. Uh, he's gone wild boar hunting with them. That's impressive. Uh, he's done, you know, fallow deer kind of hunting and stuff like that too. So definitely something to play with. Uh, well, so in uh, something else that happened while we were in the course, I know we have our, our weekends free, but uh, I had the pleasure of attending Primitive Pursuits Day. Uh, which is uh, apparently of all uh, uh, kind of a little festival of all things primitive. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yourself and another 24 instructors from the uh, instructor course uh, really were the instrumental players in kind of creating this uh, festival, which allowed several hundred people to come through from the community uh, of all ages and to get a chance to plug in to what we do, uh, experience these ancient skills, uh, but in a community setting. Uh, and of course, with this being a music town uh, and people who like to share that skill as well uh, and from my own personal uh, philosophy that music is the glue that keeps us all together uh, we had bands playing uh, old time bands zydeco bands all kinds of fun stuff so it's a i think in the primitive skills scene it's an interesting mix of stuff coming together very quickly hey, it was a really good day and, and just speaking on the part of uh, you know, being an instructor course i thought it was an amazing opportunity to immediately get involved in and practice some of the skills that we learned in the course. So, uh, in the grand theme of, of Primitive Pursuits and the 14 years that you've been involved in that kind of stuff, what is, I guess, some of your favorite things about the programs and, and uh, I guess your, you know, what, what keeps you in the program? Well, um, I know that maybe, you know, for many, say, uh, public school teachers, like, say, you're, you're in a grade, you teach third grade, and you keep getting the third graders. Uh, here the kids just keep coming back and uh, year after year and so and the instructors have the fluidity to kind of like uh, move around a little bit so working with the same kid for 10 years 12 years uh, watching the life-changing kind of occurrences that are there having those kids come back and plug in as instructors and then seeing them go off into the world to just be amazing people and it's not that they're all become primitive skills instructors I mean they they go off and do all kinds of stuff but just seeing real impacts uh, in people's lives, uh, working with folks who are sincerely interested in seeing change in the world. Uh, those are kind of the motivating factors that, that keep me involved. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, I, I think it's a strange thing to be able to be in the modern world, in the world at all, I guess, but uh, and not know the, about the environment around you, not know trees or plants or birds, you know, not knowing edibles or, or medicinals. Uh, because I feel like, you know, the modern world is, uh, modern humans have so much impact with every choice that we make, every decision that we make, uh, from products we buy to, you know, how we choose to live our life, and yet we tend to be the most unaware creatures that have ever existed. So seeing, um, seeing the awareness level, you know, rise in people just simply from the practices that we do out here, uh, and then knowing, uh, believing that however people choose to go live their life, and I don't, you know, prescribe a, what that's supposed to look like, but I'm just saying that they're, they're asking better questions, uh, looking around in a more kind of aware way, uh, and have some hard skills to go with it in terms of, you know, kind of knowledge base, uh, so, yeah, those are the things that keep me going. I'll tell you, and I, I would have to agree, and one of the concepts I think we talked about in the first couple of days was being a tourist in your own world. You know, in the, in the, you know when you walk into, the, into the, the woods, you basically, you know, without that knowledge, you're just a tourist, and you kind of bumble around and wander around, and, and you know, without really getting actively involved and, and you know, uh, taking some of these programs and, and doing that, like, you remain a tourist, and, and if you do happen... Uh, to, to unfortunately get lost out there or be in a survival situation as a tourist you know just like you would be in any other country you're just kind of lost you know right. nobody speaks your language and vice versa right yeah 
uh, and I guess I just follow up with the, it, it's inspirational. So what else keeps me involved? Like telling you know a group of ten kids, here's your challenge. Like nothing. You got no knife. You have nothing on your pack, and I want you to build a fire. You got three hours, and have them succeed at that with rocks and roots and sticks, and suddenly like we're all sitting around a fire. Um, that's just powerful. It so, really is. You know, really and, is. And, so you know, it, it's it big level, it's small level, it's personal, it's group, it's, uh, you know, so yeah, all of those things. So yeah, uh, if you want to check out uh, and learn more about any of the courses we've been talking about, the instructor course that David's part of, uh, some of the weekend workshops, we have uh, Bill Marple coming up from uh, the Tracker School to do a tracking workshop with us in August. Uh, we'll put up different ones for bow making, uh, hide tanning, things like that. So anyway, you could go to uh, primitivepursuits.com uh, to learn about that. And then also I keep a, a blog, video blog myself. You could go to survivalworks.net uh, and that'll sort of take you to a bunch of YouTube videos uh, if you wanted to be able to check out how to make cordage, uh, friction fires, various other skills that uh, we practice in the, the course uh, and time together here. Very cool and I'll make sure all those links get put in the description box below so you can click on them yourself. Uh, to include, if you'd like to check out and see more of the classes up here, uh, you can go to their Facebook and get there that way or their main page. And I just want to, uh, yeah, thank you, David, for uh, asking me to come uh, join you here on your blog and uh, for joining us in the course. It's really oh, been it's, awesome it's to have you. It's been a blast, and I'm definitely looking forward to figuring, you know, finding out what's going to happen over the next three or four days as far as the course wrap-up goes. Nice. And, you know, the, the last big overnight. Uh, so it, it'll be exciting. I'll, I'll be looking forward to, to videoing about that as well. Well, my, my biggest challenge and, and uh, for the next few days is to see if I can find something that David doesn't carry with him. Uh, ah, yes. So if you don't know him, uh, he's always prepared. And I mean, uh, I can't even name the number of, of things that you're like, who's got a, and David just says yes before we even say it, and it's true. So I, I, I have a problem. It's, <laughs> it's a good problem. It's a good problem. Not too bad. I was just noticing that the, uh, the rain is coming again. So uh, if you come visit us, bring a raincoat. Sounds good. Tim, really appreciate everything. Uh, <laughs> we're going to get to a drier place, but if you'd like to see a little bit more of my channel, you can click here for tactical product demos, or here for some practical survival tips, or even here for some non-lethal self-defense options. Look forward to seeing you next time. I was your host, David Dyer, and this was Dyer Times. Thanks. I did it. Still have my fingers. <laughs>